Hello and welcome to the Second Drafts podcast, everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. I'm Jeremy. And I'm EJ. And today we'll be discussing episodic storytelling. Now, episodic storytelling, uh, when I was first uh, introduced to it, it kind of made me think of something a little bit different. Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of uh, something like a TV show, but uh, it's not quite like that. Um, basically, there was this uh, blog post that uh, Ethan had shown me there and talking about uh, why episodic storytelling telling is uh, kind of a problem with new authors and uh, just you know ways to kind of get around that. And uh, Ethan, why don't you take us off there and tell us about that blog post? Yeah, okay. So um, I ran across this recently. I mean, it's 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 not a new post. It's from, you know, one of these posts is from uh, 2014 and the other one from 2012. So it's, you know, a couple of years <laughs> old. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was featured on the Passive Voice recently. And uh, that, you know, kind of linked to another one and another one. And I found this and I thought it would be <laughs> interesting to discuss. <laughs> the, um, the author on this uh, moody writing uh blogspot site he discussed episodic storytelling and why that might be a problem um i think especially for new authors it it happens when you know you kind of have your batch of events happening in your plot mm -hmm. but it kind of feels like there's not a a solid through line uh from one to the next you know so you've got a lot of stuff happening um but they doesn't really feel like like the events are connecting to each other. They they feel like little slices of life being presented, but you know the reader can't quite figure out what links them. What's what's going on? What's the biggest story? Almost and, like uh, a stream of consciousness, sort of. Yeah, a little bit like that. And um, I think the author here uses Alice in Wonderland as a classic example. Now. You know, he he admits, uh, you know, in in this case of Alice, it kind of does work. So, um, even though his whole thesis is that episodic storytelling can be a problem and beginner writers must beware, uh, I think he, you know, he does admit, and we can all admit that you know, sometimes it does work. For any rule that you say, oh, this is going to be a trap for people, you know, there's going to be <laughs> some Stephen King or some J.K. Rowling that just makes it work, and well, what are you going to do? <laughs> Yeah, so, and like of course, if you have something that can kind of fall along those lines, and you work at it, then you definitely uh, would be able to use it eventually. It's just kind of getting to that point that's mm -hmm. a lot harder. So you might want not want to do that for your first novel. Yeah, so not to begin. Exactly. So that was quite interesting, and I thought we could uh, maybe chat about that, and you know whether we have any experience with uh, reading stories like this, or you know what people can do to avoid this kind of thing yeah i uh, i don't really uh think i have much experience with reading anything like that but when i was uh reading the uh blog there again it uh it it almost seems like it should be called something different because i, I feel like it almost sounds like uh like a tv show like you know you have that self-encompassed episode and you're yeah. telling that episode but like uh, it's more like having all these different, as you were saying, all these different things happening in one story mm -hmm. as opposed to yeah, yeah, in multiple exactly. stories. Um, I think the, that exact, that, that blogger did point out because people commented on his blog post and said, well, you know, TV shows do episodic storytelling perfectly. And he, he came back with a new post a couple of, uh, you know, like a week later and said, well, you know, that's not quite what he means. And so I think we should be clear on this point. The the episodic storytelling that we're saying to be aware of is not so much, you know, you you have one story, one book, and then you have another book that's that's the second episode, like a series. Um, that's not the kind of thing we're talking about, because uh, obviously telling a series of 14 books like Wheel of Time, you're going to tell them in episodes and each episode is one book and, you know, there's no getting away from yeah. that. Uh, but what we mean is within one book, you have, you know, 
let's see at the 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 example this guy uses um say you know episodic he goes and the one paragraph i'm just going to read it now he says well you know let's begin mick is in love with mary but he doesn't know how to tell her so now he goes to see his pal jim jim is having an argument with his wife so mick and jim go to a local bar in the bar an entertaining drunk bets them he can guess their star sign or else he'll give them his lucky shamrock and so it goes you know these events in the same story they kind of you can tell they have nothing to do with one another you know pretty soon the reader's gonna go what what's going on here why am i reading about these events one after another they don't seem to have anything <laughs> linking them <laughs> yeah and like another uh one of the things that uh we were reading there about episodic storyline uh it kind of mentioned about like some of those things might be closer to reality like you know you might you know complain about your wife or something like that and then you go to the bar and you just have a, a yeah. fun night at the bar uh but realism isn't always very uh interesting um i'm gonna try and exactly. very find it <laughs> yeah I, i'm gonna try and try and find it here but uh they quoted uh famous author just trying oh, to I find think I know what you're going to say. Is it, uh, that was, yeah, we just had it up here too. <laughs> Sorry about this, folks. <laughs> I think Alfred Hitchcock said this. What is drama but life with the dull bits cut out? Is that yeah. what you're thinking of? Uh, yeah, it was go. something like that. That one, or it was pretty close to that. So, yeah, mm -hmm. you you don't want to have something that really is that true to life. Like you need to have kind of <laughs> that that throughput. Like you need to have focus, sort of, on mm -hmm. a specific thing, and everything kind of needs mm -hmm. to relate to that. Um, even if you look at say uh, um, something like Seinfeld, uh, Seinfeld was always uh said to be the show about nothing and you know they would have the episodes and kind of just random things happen but even in seinfeld there is kind of with each episode there is a uh, throughput like there's something that uh is kind of upcoming and happening like you have those jokes in between mm -hmm. or sometimes uh, random things will kind of happen but it does kind of still follow uh, a little bit of a story in each episode mm -hmm. Exactly. If you're really paying attention. This, yeah, yeah. This uh, touches on something that uh, is also important for people, you know, aspiring authors to realize is that uh, reality uh, is not always necessarily the best template to, to base your fiction on because um, reality has a lot of boring, dull stuff in it. And yeah. I think when it comes to fiction, uh, the reader is trusting the author to cut out all the dull stuff, all the stuff that's not directly pertinent to the story he wants to tell, and to show only the, the, the pertinent stuff, the the important stuff, and, well, well, by extension, the interesting stuff. Yeah, it's uh, also just bringing an example kind of with uh, my own stories there. Um, you have people who are on a boat, you know, it's about pirates and everything like that, it takes a long time to travel between different areas. If you say put what they did each day on on the boat in the story, then it would start to get very dull and very repetitive and nobody would really want to read that. So you kind of got to skip over that, over those parts of weeks of travel where nothing really much happens. So... Yeah, something I mean, that's one of the advantages of writing fiction. So <laughs> it isn't something you should uh, give up, I can say. Yeah. But I guess the biggest question is uh, whether uh, the episodic storytelling kind of can be replicated and whether uh, it's a writing issue or whether it's an audience issue. That's kind of my question. Uh, with uh, saying that episodic storytelling, like if 
people are reading something along those lines and they lose interest. So is that a writing issue or is it the audience's issue? Because we're so used to hmm. yeah, used to these type of things. Yeah. yeah, I think a part of it is definitely a problem with the audience and how we have changed as a society. I can always say because I definitely think there was a time, uh, let's say, that people enjoyed you know your more slower paced literary fiction uh, more. And they, you know, there were these sprawling. I can't think of an example right now, but you, you had these sprawling literary sagas that sometimes a lot of it was just vignettes, you know, like slice of life pieces that people enjoyed simply for the sake of it, rather than needing, you know, a tight plot and a focused story. And I think as we've matured uh, as a society, I think we've come to expect more along the lines of genre fiction you know things that focus on telling a story so i do but, think we've changed as a as an audience collectively i definitely agree uh, on a little part of that but uh when you were talking about that there it kind of reminded me of um the count of monte cristo and mm -hmm. that was written back i think in 1800s and when you look at that, uh, it's a huge tome. Like it's it's definitely uh, something to read. Like over the course of uh, a couple weeks, at least, even if you're a speed reader. Um, oh, yeah. But when you're reading that, everything kind of does have that through line, and it's a uh, it's a classic. It's considered a classic. So I wonder. Like the ones that we have these days that, that are considered classics from back in the day. Like, mm. do we really have that many that are considered classics that had those stream of consciousness kind of like things? Or is it the ones that appeal, uh, that have that through line, that appeal to almost everyone? Are they the ones mm. that kind of stand the test of time? Okay. I think I can name one example i think that that might fit but my caveat is i have not read it i have to admit <laughs> but uh, you know the james joyce novel ulysses yeah. as far as i understand that is one of those big sprawling you know and while it does have some through lines in the sense that it you know it's kind of based on the 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 Greek myths, it has, you know, allusions to that. Um, mm -hmm. It definitely is known for being a, a stream of consciousness book. So, and I mean, that's, that's an enormous classic that ugh, people, man, that book has mythical status. <laughs> <laughs> I keep getting them mixed up. Which one's that one? Is that the one with uh, Troy or is that? No, that's the modern one. Where you know, uh, it's it's. I think it's it plays off in Dublin. A guy kind of wanders through the city for a whole day, or maybe even more, and it's it's just a monster of a book that uh, you know it's 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 infamous for people having trouble finishing it because it's just so big and sprawling and it's um, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting. Uh, concept i think but as i said i have not read it <laughs> it's um but it is a modern classic it was written in 1922 i think yeah i think i know the one that you're that you're talking about there does that one have uh, he kind of almost makes his own language almost in that is that that one i'm not sure about that I, part. <laughs> maybe this is a different one maybe the audience uh comment below there let me know if you uh, know the name of this but uh i remember reading about a certain story where um a lot of it was written kind of almost in a language of his own design like some of the words that yeah. were in it were just made up and a lot of people uh basically you have to almost research okay. a lot to uh be able to even understand what's going on and so to read this particular tome is almost like a an achievement in and of itself 
because you have to yeah. go through so much this, to <laughs> this sounds familiar to me i think i think the story you're talking about the gold bug by edgar Allan poe is it i don't think it's that well, one okay. <laughs> maybe the audience well, will be able to tell us there maybe so. <laughs> the audience can tell us <laughs> well but yeah i think so I, personally i think that it's uh more so a little bit of both like probably writing but also audience because again like you have these these few ones that seem to apply to that episodic storytelling um you know the alice in wonderland that the blog mentioned mm -hmm. there and ulysses that you're mentioning but mm -hmm. those are so few and far between like the you can only really do that if you achieve that mythical uh classic status yeah so I, I don't think that it's uh, something that can really be replicated personally. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's it's going to be a big risk because, uh, especially for our modern audiences, um, I think we've come to expect the more tightly plotted things, and that's why so much of the you know the 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 how to books on writing fiction focuses you know they all focus on plotting and knowing where you're going and having through lines i think uh, maybe we've kind of outgrown parts of that meandering <laughs> storytelling style which is you know, not necessarily and... <laughs> a bad thing <laughs> yeah but look in the end we can say look you might be able to pull it off but it might not be worth the risk <laughs> yeah maybe try and uh try and write that once as you achieve uh stephen king status and you can you can put out yeah, a book exactly. that <laughs> that you know you won't lose money off of <laughs> yeah maybe that's at that a point good idea yeah, be established <laughs> have a following and you know hopefully they'll read anything you write <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so uh, there's a couple of ways that you can look at avoiding this kind of meandering thing Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have some thoughts for us on that? Well, yeah, the uh, what we've been kind of talking about there, having a, a through line. So having something that kind of binds everything together. Uh, so basically like having a theme uh, or even if you want to have extra stuff in there, have uh, sub themes on it. Uh, so what you can put in there, you know, it might be uh, something that relates to just the character itself uh, mm -hmm. or you know you're having your overarching plot as it were and that's what kind of brings the characters to the different locations and have those different things happen to them like mm -hmm. uh, you might say like say with Alice in Wonderland if she's if her plot through line is trying to get back home then you know, it kind of does bring everything together, as it were, because she's trying to go through this magical land, finding her way home, and then all these other random things kind of happen. So mm -hmm. you can still kind of bring those things in uh, and bind them together so that the audience is still kind of involved. Like, oh, she, okay, she's still trying to find her way home, but these guys are messing her up. And then she meets the queen and... And she's kind of trying to mess her up as well and trying to stop her from achieving that goal, as it were. Yeah. This sounds very much like uh, The Wizard of Oz at this point. And, uh, you know, there, there are a couple of similarities there in those stories. Yeah. And, yeah, with her, she kind of meets up with all these different people and all these different things start to happen. But it, she still always has that, that goal back and... Uh, to get back home in the back of her mind. So that kind of yeah. brings everything together. Yeah. And uh, do you have any other additional points there? <laughs> mm, yeah, well, that touches directly on uh, something that I wanted to mention. One way to make sure is, um, well, firstly, you can, you can make sure that you've got a solid plot through line, right? So kind of every scene the end of every scene relating to one character should kind of lead directly and logically to the next scene. At the very least, there should be some logic, you know, kind of funneling you from one scene to the next. 
And when that fails, and, you know, like in Alice in Wonderland, sometimes she goes from one situation to the other and they seem to have nothing to do with one another. Yeah. Then, <laughs> you know, if logic is failing you, then at least have something like theme pull through and be consistent, you know, so that at least the different scenes touch upon the same theme. And if theme fails you, at least try to have the different scenes, you know, develop something in the character or illuminate different aspects of the character's, you know, internal life, so that still you'll have something that pulls through. That's one way of looking at it. The other is, you know, if you focus very, you know, a bit more on your 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 overarching plotting. Here I'm talking about something like uh, Deborah Dixon's goal motivation conflict, you know, setup that she uses. That helps a lot because you set up a, a, a main goal for your character, for the story. And then, you know, in every scene, you kind of have to evaluate. Is this scene helping her reach her goal or not? Is it helping change her motivation or not? Is it uh, presenting some form of conflict to keep her from her goal? And if the scene doesn't do one of those three things, then very likely you're heading into the territory of you know, losing that connective link to the rest of your story. So, you know, as she says, each scene that you include has to change one of these three things, goal, motivation, conflict. And that kind of gives a nice framework for it so that you, you don't meander. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of uh, fiction these days, especially uh, probably m more likely Western fiction, especially is conflict oriented. So, yeah the hero or the characters themselves uh, whether they're heroes or not they have a specific goal and kind of everything kind of pushes against that even sometimes within the characters who are trying to achieve that goal they might have different motivations for that mm. and so if something you know say what you were saying there challenges the motivations of one character but not another then maybe that mm. character's goal is going to change maybe they're going to uh have that character development and maybe they won't want to achieve the same goal anymore and so all of it kind of ties together with uh, everything else almost and definitely exactly. uh, having that is definitely a good way to avoid that episodic storytelling for sure because <laughs> otherwise you're just going to be stream of consciousness again and if there's no uh, no real conflict and no real goal to uh, have the conflict go against, then it's just kind of randomness yeah. almost. So. Yeah. so just one um, caveat here is uh, I just it just occurred to me that it might sound like we're completely dissing stream of consciousness writing, and uh, you know that's that's not really true. Uh, I think stream of consciousness writing has has a great use when you're brainstorming about your characters and their motivations and what's going on in your story. Sometimes you can use that as a brainstorm to get over writer's block or something like that. It's fantastic. Uh, I think we're just talking more about the kind of final product that you want to sell for other people to read. Yeah. As, uh, there we go. That's, that's going to be different. <laughs> yeah, because even, say, uh, if you're writing, you know, you want to uh, push past a certain part there. If you just want to kind of let yourself go and write something kind of random, even in the editing process, you can kind of even try and bring it back. You can change it around a little bit, tweak it just a little bit to make it uh, more focused, more in tune with the rest of the story. Or uh, as we've said several times there, like Stephen King says, you know, uh, kill your darlings, cut it out, and <laughs> just uh, get rid of it during the editing process. Or save it for later, you know, just uh, put it into another document. and You might find that you can use it later there. And uh, just kind of along those lines as well, like we're even just talking more about the the westernization side of storytelling because uh, there might be other um, other cultures that are more attuned to something like that episodic storytelling. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I heard something or read something recently about how like stories uh, – in the say Buddhist culture would not have any conflict just because of how 
how it relates to that uh, concept of peace and loving and everything mm. like that. So yeah, of I mean, course, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, it might even still kind of have that theme, but it might feel like more of a stream of consciousness uh, side of things. So definitely, uh, yeah. for who you are writing as well is important to think about. Mm. There's there's definitely well, a way. That'll be very can... interesting if the the audience can let us know if they they know of any cultures where this kind of stream of consciousness in fiction is 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 more prevalent it'll be very interesting to find out <laughs> yeah for sure so let us know in the comments there and of course if you have an idea you know don't let it don't let uh it hold you back there from doing it if you have that an idea for that kind of episodic storytelling because mm -hmm. it can be done it has been done in the past and uh who knows you might make the next uh alice in wonderland so <laughs> <laughs> fantastic so yeah, let us know uh, in the comments there about uh, any ideas that you have. And uh, once again, thank you for joining us here at Second Drafts Podcast. Mm -hmm. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. And let us know what you'd like to see from us in future podcasts. See you next time. Cheers, guys. Do you want to support production of this YouTube series? Visit www.patreon.com slash and become a patron today.